Welcome friends to another r slash malicious compliance video. Did you know it's good luck to leave likes on videos? Take a quick second and hit that like button, it means a lot to me. That said, our first story of the day is by Tasty Snackies. Don't want to pay a sale price? Fine by me. I work for one of North America's largest aftermarket auto parts stores. One that begins with an N and has a blue and yellow logo. At this job, for a few times a year, we have what's called a bucket sale. This bucket sale acts as a marketing gimmick and it's meant to entice people to buy more than what they need. If you have three or more items, you can fit them into a 5 gallon company branded bucket and the price of your entire order is reduced by 20%. In all honesty, it's a pretty good deal for what it is. The only caveat is that you're required to purchase the bucket for $2.99. Most customers that I mention this sale to are usually surprised and impressed by the generosity, especially since I don't follow the at least three items must fit in the bucket rule as I prioritize getting a customer out of the door with a smile on their face. $200 battery? How about we make that $160? $50 headlight bulbs? Nah, screw that, take them home for $35 and get a free bucket for it. The reason that I say most customers enjoy this is because there's a handful of customers who would either not deal with having to carry a large bucket with them or simply don't understand the proposition that I'm trying to offer. Fair enough, maybe they've had a rough day and don't want to be bothered with paying less for more. It's no skin off my back. Usually this isn't a problem, except for today. Not for a certain customer that I'll refer to as Karen. Karen walks into the store, is friendly throughout the entire exchange, and knows exactly what they want. This is always a pleasant experience, as I hate customers who dwaddle around and only accept service on their own terms. As she's ready to make her purchase, the following exchange occurs. I say, okay, so right now we're looking at a total of $68.98. However, if I sell you a bucket, your order drops to $56.89. Karen says, what do you mean? Why is it cheaper? I say, I have a store-wide sale that's in effect if you buy a bucket. She says, but I don't want a bucket, I want this stuff. I say, that's fine, you don't have to take one with you. She says, but why would you still charge me for a bucket if I don't want it? I say, it's policy, I can't complete this ticket under the sale price without incorporating the bucket. She says, so why am I paying almost $70 when you just said the total was 56? I said, because I can't. Either way, I imagine you still wanna buy this stuff. She says, not if you're trying to rip me off by selling me an unnecessary bucket. Can I speak to your manager? So I get my manager and tell him what's going on before he talks with her. Manager has no patience for this kind of attitude and says, hi there, ready to go? She says, yes, but I don't want to buy a bucket. Manager says, okay, that'll be $68.98. Karen has heard herself in confusion. She says, but I want the sale price. Manager says, you don't want the bucket, which means you don't get the sale price. Karen looks at the bucket pile. In frustration, she puts down a $100 bill. Manager, while dispersing her change, says, it's a good thing you didn't want the bucket. There wouldn't have been enough money to give you your change back. A dejected Karen then leaves the premises. Oh well, we tried to help her. What I don't understand is they said that they literally didn't even have to take the bucket. You could just pretend that you bought a bucket, get it on the receipt, and walk out not paying as much. Are you surprised that a promotion like this involving this bucket confuses people like this? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is by One Sleepy Bear. Don't want me to take long breaks even though I skip most of my other ones? Like many others before me, this is a simple one that happened a couple years ago. I worked 12-hour shifts, 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. at a factory manufacturing hygienic products. We're supposed to have 5 paid breaks a night that alternate between 10 and 20 minutes, i.e. 10, then 20, then 10, then 20, and so on. I was a lead and ran a crew of 3 other people. Being a lead, I took it upon myself to skip breaks if our manufacturing line was running bad or things needed to be fixed. We had a hot cafeteria that served food, but for night shift, this was only open 7 to 11. So if you didn't get out to break early to buy food or didn't bring your own, you were kind of SOL. The problem with the cafe was the workers were at the end of their shift and didn't care about us night shift workers, so they took their time making their food. Simple salads would take around 10 minutes to put together, and being that your longest break was 20 minutes, it gave you no time to eat. So to the meat of it, like I said, I skip breaks pretty frequently to keep the line running good, sometimes 3 out of 5 of my breaks. I forgot my lunch at home one night and figured I was going to grab some food on my 20 minute break. 
They took 12 minutes to make a salad, and I wasn't gonna have it sit out or in the fridge because I wanted it fresh, so I took a 30 minute break to eat my food. I ended up skipping two more breaks that night. Right before the end of the night though, my supervisor pulled me from the line saying I can't be taking long breaks like that. We argued back and forth saying that since I skip breaks and the cafe takes forever to make food, one 30 minute break should be okay. But they say that the scheduled breaks aren't 30 so I shouldn't do that. I dropped it, but I told them if I didn't have time to get food and eat while I was still skipping breaks, I would take 30. He said he would take corrective action. I did it one more time and he gave me a verbal warning. Cue malicious compliance. I took every break right on the dot the next couple nights. Lying down and needed me to do work? Told my text to clean and I'll fix it when I'm back. Machine calling out? If you see bad product, shut it down and we'll figure it out when I get back. After about a week of this, I got asked in the end of the night meeting why my numbers were dropping and things have been getting worse. I told them I started taking all my breaks on time because my super told me off for taking a couple extra minutes to eat lunch. No one liked that super anyway and they talked to management about it. While technically the policy states those break times are what we should be following, the fact that I was skipping breaks and getting good numbers, and it wasn't interfering with the other crew members breaks, it shouldn't be a problem. He still works there and makes everyone's life a living heck, cracking the whip and getting people in trouble for stupid stuff, but last I heard he was under investigation about how he's running things. I left about 6 months after that though because of how he was trying to be more of a manager than the actual manager was and had a terrible attitude doing it and made everything so stressful. At the very least, I think they need to have some kind of policy in place where if you use your 20 minute break to get food from the cafeteria of the place that you work at and they're taking way too long to make this food, you shouldn't be penalized and forced to eat half the food then, I don't know, put it in the fridge or throw it away. That's not to mention the fact that OP was regularly skipping breaks, so they had plenty of room to turn a blind eye just a little bit. This next story is by Ram Tam Tama. Don't leave your department during shift. This happened back when I was 18 or 19, so best part of 15 years ago. I was working for one of the big four supermarkets in the UK, doing a 5pm to 10pm shift, 4 nights a week. I was on the beers, wines and spirits section. In October, I went to the warehouse to get some more stock to put out and the phone rang at the BWS section of the warehouse, which was behind a locked door because theft. I answered it and it was the store manager and the conversation went a bit like this. The manager says, OP, why aren't you out on your department? I say, I'm getting more stock to put out. They say, if we got fined 5,000 pounds for you not being there, would you pay it? I say, wouldn't it just be cheaper to have someone else work alongside me than pay a fine? They say, I don't want you leaving the BWS section during your shifts unless you have someone to cover. I say, so stay there all shift? They say, yes. Brilliant. Just brilliant. The first time in 18 months that store manager stays late and has his shift overlap mine, he has a go at me for doing my job. Then I remembered that I was a lazy sod and I'd just do what he said. So for the rest of my shift, I just stayed in the BWS section. Didn't get anybody to cover at all. At the start of my shift, everybody else was on checkouts and the late crew were never willing to lend a hand. So it started in October, then November maybe a few hundred quid in lost sales every night, and a backlog of stock that would have to be sorted out the next morning. Then came the best part, December. As you might know, people like a tipple around Christmas and New Year. Supermarkets also like to put offers on alcoholic drinks around that time too. I wasn't allowed to get more stock to put out, so certain vodkas, gins, whiskeys, wines, ales, champagnes, etc. all sold out. I knew there was plenty of the stuff in the back, but I wasn't going to disobey store manager, especially when I'd been doing such a good job until now. So those few hundred pounds a night turned into thousands a night. I estimated that in the week leading up to Christmas, I'd cost the store around 50,000 pounds in 20 hours. That wasn't solely from lost alcohol sales, but the number of people who just dumped their trolleys, shopping carts, and left without buying anything. New Year passed with the same story, and Valentine's Day, and the entirety of March. Then two weeks before Easter, store manager stayed late to talk to me. Didn't bother when we were losing loads of sales, only in the few months before his contract renewal. He says, why haven't you been putting stock out for the last six months? I say, you told me not to. 
He says, why haven't you had anyone else cover? I say I tried, but knights weren't interested. He says, so why didn't you just go and get any stock? I tell him, you told me not to. He says, I didn't mean it literally. So I ask, so why did you say it? During that conversation, he didn't explicitly tell me to change what I was doing, so I didn't. Easter passed, as did his contract renewal date. At the start of June, the former deputy manager was now the store manager. The ex-deputy manager stayed late to talk to me on her second week in her new position and told me to go back to doing what I was supposed to be doing. I said, okay mum, and went straight into the warehouse. Ah. I forgot to mention that my mum was the deputy manager and hated store manager because of how he treated the younger, 16 to 21 year old members of staff, and says she let regional management know about it at the annual review. Definitely helps your confidence on acting maliciously in this way when you know you got your mom as backup. Little bit of that nepotism factor, but hey, OP only did what the store manager was asking them to. This next story is by Maleficent Use 2651 returning company property, malicious compliance, and counter malicious compliance. These MCs are also related to uniforms. Several years ago, I worked at a company that had been awarded a large, if not permanent, government contract. Being in a niche market and next to no competitor, the boss's focus were solely internal, i.e. micromanagement, gotcha moments, etc. We also had a fairly high turnover for its size, two or three resignations every six months, and I'm not surprised one bit. Not long after getting the job, I overheard management comparing newbies to monkeys. Team Leader A saying, you get monkeys if you're paying bananas. Boss says, monkeys can do their jobs better, and I save on paying wage, insurance, benefit. Rage, rage, but new grad has no leverage, student loan still has to be paid. I keep head down, learned to human, networked, surveyed skills required in related fields, and eventually began a side degree, still working full time. I apparently humaned quite well, got a raise of $13 per fortnight pre-tax to train newbies. I remind each one coming through to always develop themselves and be ready for opportunities. Back to uniforms, they were smart looking shirts, so perfectly okay to wear out and about. Two were issued to us at the beginning of employment. Uniform is not required if working in sterile environment. So sometimes I commute to work in civilian clothes and then go straight to the sterile room. Being a trainer, I go in and out of the sterile room as required, so I keep the uniform in a locker. The drama? One day I walked into the office to what was the aftermath of a heated exchange between boss and a newbie. Noob was crying and boss was accusing Noob of being a drama queen and began listing all unrelated, trivial mistakes Noob had made in the few months Noob was here. Turned out Noob had found a new job and was handing in his notice. It was a record for the shortest employment at the company. This angered boss and Noob retorted that the new job has better prospects. Noob then proceeded to quit on the spot. Boss pulled out some policy and demanded the uniform be stripped off and returned now as they were company property. It was summer and Noob clearly didn't want to go home wearing undergarments only, so he offered to wash the uniform and give cleaned ones back, to which Boss reiterated the company property policy, saying walking away in uniform is theft. Gotcha, right? Enter the counter malicious compliance. I ask how many uniforms were issued. Boss said two owed. I go to my locker, gave Noob my two uniforms to hand in. Noob went home with dignity, technically owing Boss nothing. I quit months later to a role that almost doubled salary. Companies going strong last I heard. Moral of the story, be the change you want to see in the world. I can understand the whole micromanaging and the gotcha moment thing when you got really nothing else to manage I guess. Guess that's a lovely perk of a niche or smaller business that just doesn't have outside worries that take a lot of priority. but. How messed up do you have to be to go to somebody who's saying that they're leaving and say, take your clothes off right now? Surely in the eyes of the law, there's got to be some kind of greater issue with that. Like, they're not going to keep the clothing, they're just trying to remain modest, right? Like, what are they going to do, physically prevent them from leaving? Are they going to call the cops because they're not taking their clothes off and handing them over right now? You want to get a police escort back to my place so I can change and bring them back to you? You're not going to pull them off yourself, I know that. It might have been a little bit of a gotcha moment, but like, 
There was no ground for that guy to stand on. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. So of all these stories I've read today, which is your favorite and why? Let me know in the comments down below. And if you haven't yet, if you could like and subscribe, that would mean a lot to me. Whatever you do, whether it's liking, subscribing, turning notifications on, all of it helps grow this channel and I appreciate the heck out of it. So until next time, I'll see you all tomorrow with some more stories.